We are back with another Titans tier list. We're gonna be highlighting the best and worst performers from the first six weeks. I did one for the first three weeks after the Cleveland game, if you wanna go check that out, but we're gonna be updating the tiers. There's no easy way to do this, but this updated version is gonna be for the whole season, but I am gonna weight it more heavily for the recent games. If someone had a rough week one, I'm not gonna ding them too much if they were good outside of that. And before we start, I wanna hit on some big picture topics. The first one is what the Titans overall strategy should be. Right now, if we look at snap weighted age, the Titans have the third Third oldest team in the NFL. This table weights a player's age by how many snaps they've played. It's only for weeks one through five, but I don't think anything major would change from one more week. So the third oldest roster and they're straight up just not a good team. And I think the worst thing you can do from a team building perspective is try to force the issue and make a mediocre team above average. I'm of the opinion that if you're not a Super Bowl contender or you don't have a young core that you think in two or three years could develop into a Super Bowl contender, you should be selling assets, trying to acquire draft capital and setting yourself up for the future. And I think that's an opinion that most fans of any team hold. I've seen nine and eight seasons. That doesn't really do it for me anymore. But a coach and a GM are usually going to have different philosophies than a fan of that team or just a neutral observer. Mike Vrabel's two and 11 in his last 13 games. I wouldn't really say he's on the hot seat, but losses continuing to stack up isn't doing any favors for his job security. So when you get to a decision like who to start at quarterback, I'm going to have a different opinion, I think, than the front office will. We're going to see Malik Willis or Will Levis get some starts in the next few weeks. But unless Ryan Tannehill gets traded, which I think is now a lot more difficult with his injury. Mike Vrabel is going to start the quarterback that gives him the best chance to win, and I still think that is Ryan Tannehill. My opinion on the quarterback situation is that they should start Will Levis and try to get as much data and information as possible. I did a video breaking down Malik Willis's sacks, and I don't think it was as bad as it looked in the broadcast, but the indecisiveness, unwillingness to pull the trigger on easy throws, and overall just inconsistent ball placement has only marginally improved since we first saw him, and I think you got to find out as much as you can about Will Levis heading into this draft. As far as should they trade veterans, I think they absolutely should. They probably should have done that this offseason, but I don't think they have a ton of valuable pieces that are going to get you anything more than a fourth round pick at best. I think the Eagles could be a good fit for Kevin Byard. My guess would be a sixth or maybe a fifth round pick, but there's a good chance Justin Simmons from Denver is going to be on the market, so you're going to be competing against that. And looking around contending rosters in the NFL, there aren't a ton of safety needy teams. I think Tier Tart, there seems to be issues between him and the coaching staff, so he could be a guy that gets moved. If a team like Cleveland wanted to trade for Derrick Henry, I think that could be a good fit. And then DeAndre Hopkins, if someone was willing to give him something crazy for him, I guess you would trade him. But it's hard for me to see teams offering that much for a player that was available in free agency in August. And I also agree with the argument that you want to have him there for whichever young quarterback you're going to develop. So that's kind of where I view the Titans from a team building perspective. Getting into the roster, there's two players that aren't going to make the tier list because they haven't played enough snaps, but they would both be somewhere in the bad to disaster tier, probably both in the disaster. NPF came in for Andre Dillard and did not look good at all in pass pro. He is an upgrade to Dillard as a run blocker, I think, but on that last drive, he was just getting worked snap after snap. I got a lot of questions about NPF from my last video, so I'll just give you a quick rundown of kind of the history of my evaluation of him. When I watched him as a prospect, I watched his final year at Ohio State where he was playing left tackle, and his left tackle tape was brutal in pass protection. I had an early fifth round grade on him. The Titans take him in the third round, which I definitely thought was high, but when I heard they were drafting him to play right tackle, I watched his junior year tape where he was playing that position, and it was a lot more impressive. And then his rookie year tape, I thought was really mistake prone, but he definitely showed flashes of at least being a starting caliber right tackle. And so I still have some hope that he could develop into that, but everything we've seen from him on the left side has just been unplayable. And if the penalties continue like this, that's just a non-starter. And then the second player I want to hit on is Kyle Phillips, definitely a player that at this point I was wrong about. Now, none of my pro Kyle Phillips takes were based on special teams. Maybe he is a really dynamic returner. I wouldn't know. He never catches the ball. But what's really concerned me more over the last couple weeks has been him getting locked up by man coverage. I'm still going to give him some leniency since he's coming back from an injury, but he doesn't look as explosive as he did last year or really any time that I've watched his tape. The change of direction ability, explosiveness out of his breaks just really isn't there. All right, looking at the rest of the roster, last time we went from bad to good. We'll switch it up this time, go the opposite direction. The Titans' two best players over these first six weeks have been Tajay Spears and Roger McCreary. With Tajay, it's a lot of the stuff I've already said. He has big play potential, but he also has the ability to get himself out of trouble when the run blocking isn't good, which with the Titans is pretty often. He's a good receiving back. He's a great pass protector, especially for a rookie. And yeah, I just don't have anything negative to say about him. And Roger McCreary has continued to play lockdown coverage from the slot. He's really been the only player from last year's draft class that's shown any signs of improvement. And then Josh Wiley's been great in limited action. He's made some key run blocks. Anytime they've thrown him the football, he's caught it. He has the speed to threaten on seam routes. And if we continue to see this from Josh Wiley, you're going to get fewer snaps to players like Trayvon Wesco, Jeff Swaim. People get fixated on these individual blocking tight ends, but these 
these guys are on every roster. They're just most teams third tight end. So if Josh Wiley can develop into a true Y that can block and be a receiving threat, that's going to let Chig Okonkwo play a more complimentary role. And you're going to have less guys on the field that can only do one thing. And then Sean Murphy Bunting's also been really good in coverage. Week one, teams were looking at the Titans secondary and saying he was the guy they wanted to target. But pretty quickly, they realized that if they're not targeting the left side of the field three times per drive, it's basically point shaving. Onto the good, DeAndre Hopkins, I moved him up a tier. He's a great zone route runner, catches the ball consistently. He has the ability at times to win against man coverage. You can throw him jump balls down the sideline. That's a relatively high percentage play. What's keeping him out of the great tier is that there still are too many examples of him just getting locked up. And against teams with really good man coverage corners, he can kind of get taken out of the game. I'm definitely taking his over on receiving yards anytime they play the Colts though. Gus Bradley's obsession with cover three needs to be studied. D-Hop was just finding holes in those zones every play. But overall, he's been a really good player. One of the last people on offense you could complain about. Peter Skaronski, I was back and forth between good and solid on him. His week one performance against the Saints was almost perfect. There was one play where he was too late to react to a stunt, but other than that, it was all positively graded plays. The last two games have been a little bit more up and down, nowhere near on Andre Dillard level or anything, but Justin Matabike was able to get him a few times, and I think he may still be recovering from the appendix, but long term, I'd be surprised if he didn't end up being a good player. My most unpopular Titans opinion is that Kevin Byard's been playing just as well as he has the last two years. He just hasn't really gotten the opportunity for interceptions. I think he still has it in terms of speed and athleticism. He's one of the most reliable tackling safeties in the NFL. He has been for his entire career. And when I watch all these coverage snaps, he's someone that's just consistently in the right spot, picking up routes, playing with the right leverage. As a safety to get a lot of interceptions, you're reliant on a pass rush, tipped passes, quarterbacks making bad decisions, and he just hasn't really gotten those opportunities. But the actual tape, I think, has been really good. And then Jeffrey Simmons, I'm going to move from great to good. He started off really strong as a pass rusher, but week by week, the wins have been a lot less frequent. With all of the pass rushers, I'm giving them a slight benefit of the doubt for the last two matchups against Anthony Richardson and Lamar Jackson. Pass rushing is different with a mobile quarterback. A lot of times you're not trying to get quick pressure, but he's still making an impact in that phase. You just want it to be more consistent. And the run defense I mentioned was a problem the first three weeks. That has continued. Every game from this year, you can find one or two reps of him getting flattened. I put Derrick Henry and Chris Moore into the solid tier. Not a whole lot to say about them. Derrick Henry, I think, is past his prime, but still a really good player. But what I've always said about him is that he's a player that's very dependent on good run blocking. When you get free defenders in the backfield before he's built up speed, he's just not going to be that effective. And it's happening a lot more with this offensive line than it was in 2019 or even 2020. Danico Autry's moving down two. Part of this is that I think I had him a tier two high when I first did this. He's good for two or three splash plays per game, but the consistency as a pass rusher isn't where it was last year. The cross chop swipe move aren't hitting as often. And then Arden Key's also going to move down a tier. He's a player for the past few weeks that just doesn't pop when I watch the broadcast, but watching the film, I always come away a lot more impressed. Jeffrey Simmons was talking about effort and players wanting to be there. I think Arden Key is one player that gives 100% every snap. I think part of the analysis does have to factor in that Trevor Penning just might be really bad. So he had eight pressures in week one. Now he's getting like three or four a game. And then a new addition is going to be Kyle Pecco to the solid tier. Early in the season, he wasn't anchoring well against the run, but I think you can make an argument that he was their most valuable defensive player in week six. Just playing with insane effort, making plays in the backfield, making plays from across the field. If you're enjoying the video, make sure to subscribe and leave a like and also follow us on all of our social medias. The links to those are in the description. Moving on to the average and mediocre tier, there isn't a whole lot of differentiation between these two. I put Aaron Brewer in this tier just because of what he gives you as a run blocker and especially on screens. He's had a couple nice pancakes on DBs the last couple weeks. He's just a weapon in that phase of the game, but there are limitations that come with him in pass pro. NWI, I have in the average tier. I think you could make the argument for solid. He makes the most out of his opportunities. He catches the ball consistently. He's developed into an even better run blocker. There's just so many plays and route concepts they try to run where you need someone that can threaten down the field quickly, and he just cannot do that. Unlike slide routes and more tight end type of routes, he can be effective, but there's just nothing threatening over the top for a corner and man coverage. Aziz Alshire and Jack Gibbons are both in the average tier. They had a really bad week five. Both of them, I thought the tackling was passive, and in the same way that Ryan Tannehill is going to be a reflection of the pass blocking and the receivers, the linebackers are going to be a reflection of what's going on up front, and you look at the amount of investment they've put into this position. They've got a UDFA and a prove it deal to another team's third linebacker. This is not a defense that's built to have the linebackers be the point of attack. They need to win up front or win with the secondary. And then Daniel Brunskill is going to move down two tiers. The pass blocking has steadily declined since the first three weeks. There are certain one-on-ones where he's just going to be overmatched athletically and it's going to result in a lot of ugly losses. And those have started to become more and more common over the last few weeks. And then I've also got Chris Hubbard in this tier. I know the stats look good in terms of like pass block win rate, but he's just getting so much help and 
and ultimately pass protection is a resource allocation game. If you're having to dedicate chip help to the right side of the offensive line every passing down, that's one less player that's helping out another spot on the offensive line, that's one less player releasing out on a route. If you're trying to run a high-low concept to the sideline and it takes two extra seconds for your flat route to develop, that corner doesn't have any incentive to stay shallow. They're going to sink on the deeper route. It just overall makes your offense less efficient. Ryan Tannehill, I'm kind of out of new things to say about him. If you remove week one, the play's been passable, but there have been a handful of missed opportunities. He just doesn't elevate his supporting cast. And at this point, we've kind of seen the best case scenario with Ryan Tannehill. And then Chigakonkwo hasn't taken much of a step from last year. He had a couple pass interferences against the Colts, hasn't had reliable hands, and he's always been a player, I think, that's had good technique and effort as a run blocker. There's just a limit to what kind of one-on-one -on -one matchups you can put him in. If you get him on the move on slice blocks, have him blocking linebackers, DBs, he can really excel in that role. But if you're asking him to like down block defensive ends, he's just not going to get any movement. The defender's easily going to be able to shed that block. So that kind of limits how prominent of a role he can have in this kind of offense. Traylon Burks and Dylan Radins are going to stay in the bad tier. We haven't really seen much of them since the first three weeks. And Harold Landry is also going to be in the bad tier. He's just not an impact pass rusher at this point. He's never been that good of a one-on-one -on -one pass rusher, but the injury has clearly caused him to lose a step. I have no reason to think he can't return to prior form. That's just not what he is this year. And then moving on to the disaster tier, we've once again got the same two players, Andre Dillard and Christian Fulton. Nothing's changed with Andre Dillard since the last video. The nicest thing I can say is at times he's been better than Dennis Daly. And then Christian Fulton, I'm keeping in the disaster tier because he has single-handedly lost this team games. The Colts game was almost as bad as the Cleveland game. He's been getting beat in pretty much every way possible. He's been getting beat at the line of scrimmage, at the route break. When he does play good coverage, he panics at the end, grabs the jersey, draws a penalty. I will say he played most of the game in week six, and I thought that was by far his best performance of the season, which I know is a low bar, but he was playing tight man coverage. He had some really nice press coverage reps against Rashad Bateman, Odell Beckham. When he was in off, he did a good job staying square, playing tight without being too aggressive, and he also made a few impact plays in run defense. So a lot of the optimism about the Titans defense was based in part on the assumption that they'd have a semi-reliable cornerback one. Christian Fulton wasn't that for three of the first four games, but I think week six was a step in the right direction. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy the video, make sure to like and subscribe. Also, let me know in the comments any NFL players or teams that you'd like me to cover.